I don't have any friends and I'm not a people person. <laughs> Common Michelle. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Oh, good. I was trying to think of what welcome is in, in Swedish, but I can't. You're looking very nice. You've had your hair cut. I've had my hair cut, yep, and it's I had a pink rinse. <laughs> <laughs> a rose rinse. A rose. Thanks to my very trendy hairdresser, Akeem. Heads up. Heads up? <laughs> no. Big up. Big up, Akeem. Yeah. Shout out. I need to give a shout out as well to Tiff who has been quietly listening in the background without making any fuss and without writing in. Please write in, fans. Please write in. Well, I have a a quiet shart out also. Did you have a quiet shart? Oh, God. With a shit reference. Thank you very much for that. Start again. No, no. (laughs) No, I I didn't. Shart again. Shart. Oh, fuck. It's going to be one of those days. Oh, I've had a drink. (laughs) It's 11 o'clock in the morning. I had a drink last night. I think it's still in the system. Oh, good. That's very nice. Let's give Leslie a shot, Art. Who the hell's Leslie? It's Lindsay. Oh. (laughs) We're off to a flying start. (laughs) I love it. Lindsay. Lindsay Sadler. She... Uh, the same as with your last shout out. She's just been quietly listening in the background. Yeah. Just, just casually just mentioned. Listening. Casually yeah. mentioned. She's loving, loving the podcast. So thank you, Aww. Lindsay, for well, if listening. You- Drop a casual mention, <laughs> listeners, eavesdroppers, and we will drop a shout out on you. And I know it thrills them. I know. I, I know it's a thrill <laughs> to hear your name in lights. Yeah. <laughs> shout, shout out. out. Shout out! You're shout getting out. a shout out. You're getting a shout out. Fucking hell! Oh dear. Right, Michelle. Oh dear. Last week's summer potluck party. I haven't had any feedback from my mother. Thinking, where's the food? Okay. So as a result, I mean, she hasn't bothered me about it. She hasn't said, "Hey, I was expecting to talk about, I don't know, margarine or something." <laughs> but no. So today we're going to talk about food, aren't we? We are, and I'm quite excited about it because we have talked just as a conversation about food. I think this is why you have previously thought we had done a, a food episode. Yes, because we talk about it. We do. And I love talking about food. I love talking about food. Michelle, I feel a little bit discombobulated. I feel like we've gone all around the houses and back again and not, not made a, a scrap of sense No, we so haven't. Far. We haven't. We haven't. We haven't. However, all right, let's go back to – I just want to have a quick recap yeah, of last week's potluck party, right? Well, no, no. the one before, Marilinka. Oh, the nuclear tests. Yes. So I had a little uh, message from Neil, the scientist, who had listened <gasps> while he was vacuuming. Oh, Neil, blind me with science, Neil. I <laughs> love it when Neil gets in touch. And I have a, an idea, a mental image of him being a little Freddie Mercury with the Hoover <laughs> and his skirt, listening to the Marilinga episode. So I want to break free <laughs> in a bikini. So bikini atoll. There you go. There's a right. connection there. That was a good segue, Michelle. Kind of, but not really. So he sent me two links. Very interesting. I'll put them in the show notes. So the first one. It's all about. Not an upside to nuclear testing because it's hard to find an upside. Right, yeah. But clever scientists all over the world have realized that nuclear bombs have made it possible to carbon date human tissue. Huh? When, When nuclear testing was happening, it caused a spike in carbon 14. So, what's that? Carbon-14, look, I'm not going to get into the details of this, although it is actually really fascinating. But um, before before all the atom bomb testing, there was a very steady level of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Then after, like during that period and after, the levels of carbon-14 doubled in the Earth's atmosphere. And what is pretty scary is that no matter where you were in the world, because basically carbon-14 exists in the air, then plants breathe in carbon-14 during photosynthesis. Animals Mm -hmm. eat those plants. We eat those animals. Carbon-14 winds up in our bodies 
And yeah. then it's in our tissues, right? Oh, I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. No. So the thing is, if you measure how much carbon-14 someone has in different tissues in their bodies, um, they can actually understand when those tissues were formed, right? Oh. And then they can kind of compare the amount in a tissue with what normally would be in a human tissue to get a pretty precise date. And also it means that doing sort of scientific experiments, doctors now have really, really precise ways of understanding when tissues form and how long tissues last and how quickly they're replaced just by using this carbon-14 dating. So it's really, really interesting, although obviously it's decreasing. So there's only really about 30 more years where they can use this carbon-14 before the carbon-14 in the, in the atmosphere goes back to normal. But he also sent me a link, very interestingly, on how this, this carbon-14 is helping to identify art forgeries. Because oh. what art forgers do usually is they use an old canvas and then put on new paint. And so they've always been, uh, like people who have been testing art forgeries, it's been very inconclusive because they, they check from the canvas, but the canvas is old. Now what they can do is take a tiny sliver of paint and use this carbon carbon 14 way of measuring because, you know, like I said, you've got this spike, pre, pre-atomic, pre post-atomic. And if it's got post-atomic carbon-14 levels in the paint, which they have used, like it's basically the binders, so oils, then they can discover whether or not it's a forgery. If someone's saying it's from the 1800s, no, sir. No, sir. So very interesting. Right. Thank you for those links, Neil the Scientist. Thanks, Neil the Scientist. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, from science to spirituality, Oh, Michelle, yes. Okay. Our resident mysticist, modern mystic, Tamira, shut out. Not shut up, but shout out. <laughs> Tamira, she, she loves to listen and she wrote in after our last episode, which was the summer pot luck, where we did go on a little bit and I feel terrible about it still, but I'm still murdering them. Killing moths in my pantry, you pouring boiling water down an ant's nest. Oh, I didn't. It was just the hose. It wasn't boiling. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sound like some kind of torture. Yeah, like- so we've both got our own insect problems and we both dealt with uh, dealing with them well. Tamira said, first of all, she gives us a little bit of advice on how to get rid of moths. And what she does is put whole cloves, you know, the cloves that you pierce in apples at Christmas time. She puts them in a small container and that also works for weevils. She doesn't say what happens. Do they get attracted to it? Do they just die from the smell? Do they fall into the container and then you trap them and then let them free? I don't know. But she said cloves. So hang on. Let's use some cloves. May I just stop? I think you put cloves in oranges. Yeah, you're right. I think. Anyway, small aside. Let's let's move on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's that kind okay. of morning. <laughs> it's that kind of morning, right? So Tamira said she believes that when an insect turns up, it is sharing a spiritual message. Michelle. Okay. Whoa. So for you, Michelle, yes. with your ants being overwhelmed with ants, yeah, to the point where you even saw the queen, didn't you? Well, I didn't see the queen ant. She was stuck down there, but I knew she was she was close. I think she has popped her head up, but all her worker ants were returning these poor, drowned, ruined eggs back to the, the nest. That you had ruined, yes. Well, you need to consider that all good things come with time and effort. That is the message that the ants are delivering you, Michelle, spiritually. Because despite their tiny size, these spirit animals are highly tenacious. They have a superior strength of will and accomplishment can come in even the smallest of packages. (gasps) Okay. This is your message from the ants. Alternatively, it may be time to reconsider your role. Concentrate on your specialties and, like the catfish, make sure you are making the most of your natural gifts. That's very interesting because I just got a new job where I am making the most of my talents rather than helping everybody else. There you go. Very interesting. Amazing. She's spot on as usual. Wow, Tamira, seeing seeing into my soul. (laughs) (laughs) 
Also, at Symbolism, insists you must remain aware that all things are connected. Mm. Therefore, the ant meaning reminds you, Michelle, to think about how your contributions to your career, your family and day-to-day life fit into the larger picture. And in conclusion, no matter how small your task, your input, Michelle Margarita, is essential. <gasps> I love that reading. I absolutely love it. Thank you. It's not finished. Not finished. Another ant meaning, especially when encountered in large numbers of the creatures, Michelle, which you were inundated with ants, weren't you? Is that it's time to get active in your community. So make a point of getting involved in a new project, cause or charity. Generally speaking, ant symbolism usually focuses on the social aspect of a community. It's time for you to give back. That's very interesting. I thought I thought she was saying, oh, maybe it's time to make some friends because I'm not a people person. Well, it could be that. I don't have any friends and I'm not a people person. <laughs> Good luck with that then. Good luck making friends. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've got friends. You don't need new ones. No, I, I don't have time for new friends. I've got plenty, plenty of old friends that I barely have enough time for. But that oh. is really fascinating. I Isn't it? Yeah, I hadn't even thought about connecting my ant issue to a a greater picture there's a lot to think about in that reading in that spirit animal do you want to hear about my moths yeah I was going to say what does she say about you killing moths and like chasing after larvae who are (laughs) terrified she she doesn't say that um that I should be killing them for a start but she does say that the spirit animal of moths insists that now is the time for me to transform my emotional energy I must have faith in my journey and moth symbolism also dictates that I should trust that I will eventually see the light even if things seem complicated right now use my heart to guide me That is a really nice message. I think there's something in that because we've all gone through times where we cannot see the wood for the trees, but you just have to have faith to keep going because... Keep going. And follow follow your heart rather than your head. Interesting. Good. She says, people with the moth totem are the most optimistic of souls, Michelle. I would say that. Would you say that's me? Yes, because I wouldn't... I mean, you're definitely more optimistic soul than I am. I would would agree. (laughs) They can... (laughs) I would agree you're a bitch. <laughs> I, I agree with that with that sentiment. They can find the silver lining in every crisis, yeah. the light in any darkness and the love in any frustration. I have to say that all of those things are being tested for me right now. But uh, yeah, I can. I do know what I have to do and that is just focus on the light. Just get through it. Mm. No, really interesting that just randomly we happen to talk about these two Issues, and then we got this fantastic. Yeah, we get this fantastic reading, which is actually very pertinent to our lives in this moment. She's spot on. I tell you what, Tamira dot com people, look her up. She's taking UK clients. So my ability to seek out, so not just mine, but the people like me who have the moths as their totem. Mm. It says their ability to seek out the positive in any situation makes them a good listener for their peers. They are also great peer counselors, advice givers as well as highly sought after as a friend. what Are you trying to kill a moth right now? What was that? Oof. Oh, do you know what? You're probably going to hear this on the podcast. There is a, a massive fly just buzzing oh, well, all around Tamira, my studio. Tamira, what is a fly? <laughs> what does a massive, great, big, dirty fly mean for Michelle around her head? <laughs> Maybe it means time to have a wash. God, don't even. I actually, that's probably true because our shower, we don't have a shower right now, so we're just doing horse bath. <laughs> horse bath. <laughs> a horse bath. Yeah, a horse bath. You know, <laughs> flannel. You Top just, and tail. Well, you just have to get a flannel and wash yourself yeah. down and stick your head in the sink and wash your hair and it's it's not been A fun. lick and a promise. I lo- yeah. <laughs> At least we've got a toilet now. Oh, thank God. People with the moth totem. Yes. That's still going on about me. Are accessible and generous with their attention. They understand the subtleties of the way the universe works around them. And that's the end of my reading. I think that is actually very spot on for you as a character. I think so. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's really given me food for thought. I, I mean, what does she say? What does she say, though, about the ants? I shouldn't kill them because they're there. Well, no, she doesn't say anything about not killing them. She's been very kind of like she's been keeping those feelings to herself. Okay. But. 
she just thought it was interesting. She seemed to know mm. what it means to have an inundation of ants or moths. And we both are experiencing that right yeah. now. Practically a fucking plague of moths. Oh. I'm killing them as fast as they're being born. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sport now for you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. A damp cloth squish. There we go. <laughs> Ew. Well, well that's, that's one, one for the bin. 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 Honestly, I remember as a kid, I did you used to have a, a like, we called it a haversack. I don't know what they called it, but it was like the army, army haversack. It's a rucksack. It's a rucksack, but they, we called them haversack. Haversack. Haversack back in the day. Um, and a knapsack. And you, a knapsack. With a knapsack on my back. A knapsack. Valerie. <laughs> what? That's all. But do you remember you go to the army surplus store to get it? So yeah. you would get either, like all the all the cool kids had the, the navy one, the navy coloured one. But oh. I had more the kind of sacky coloured one. Anyway, always, every week, uh, mouldy orange in the bottom of the, oh. of the haversack or the knapsack. And also... Haversack. Moldy sandwiches. Oh, I I grew a new life form on my old vegetarian lasagna, which I left under my bed for six weeks once <laughs> oh my in my lunchbox <gasps> when I was about 14, 15. Oh, well, this brings me nicely actually into the food episode because food. food. I've said it twice now. Yes. Food. 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 Because when we were kids, I mean, our, our father was he sadly passed away uh he he was italian and yeah we were the kids that looking back now had the cooler sandwiches but at the time were the most embarrassing embarrassing sandwiches because yeah. dad would go and buy the amazing italian bread you had to go to queen bian where all the italians hung out and buy these incredible big kind of crusty loaves of italian bread and then, oh. you know, he would he would make us, not all the time, but when he would make the sandwiches, he would put on the prosciutto and the stinky cheese and oh. all of the amazing stuff. And our sandwiches were like an inch and a half thick. You know, they were wow. amazing. But we were so embarrassed because everyone had... They stank? Well, they stank for a start, but everyone else had white bread with a bit of Devon and tomato sauce. Oh, Devon. Do you want to just explain what Devon is? <laughs> it's basically lips and assholes all minced up, pressed together. And wrapped in a red casing and you slice it. You get it yeah. sliced. Yeah. And it's it's a luncheon meat, isn't it? It is a lunch meat, yes. Just to segue luncheon. away from your story, just for a moment... <laughs> <laughs> I once went back to Australia some years ago and my parents were eating a Devon-like luncheon meat. And I said, oh, what's that, mum and dad? And they said, oh, it's Bolina. And I was like, Bolina? Bolina? Do you mean like Bologna or Bologna or a Bologna? Is it that? We don't know. We just say, we just call it Bolina. That's what it says. We'll, we'll show you tomorrow when we go shopping. So we went to Woolies the next day and they said, can we have 100 grams of that Berliner? Here it is, love. This is the Berliner. I was like, Mum, it's Berliner. <laughs> and I she still said, don't even know what Berliner or Berliner is. Berliner. It's a sausage. Is Berliner. It? Berliner. Yeah. <laughs> Berliner. Berliner. It's from Berlin. And she said, well, you say it your way. We'll say it out. You say tomato. I say tomato. Berliner, Berliner. Oh, goodness me. Berliner, Berliner. Well, yeah. do you know what, Mum... Very confusing. Do you know what? That just reminds me. We used to have chicken loaf. Do you remember? Oh, it was square. No. <laughs> yeah, mum would always buy a chicken loaf. So it chicken was loaf? it was basically pressed chicken. But, it, I mean, I don't think there, were, there was any actual chicken in there. And you would sometimes I get the, the bits of like – The lumps. The lumps of the fat fatty – gristle. Well, yes. more like the gelatinous lumps in the in the chicken loaf. So we would sometimes yes. have chicken loaf on, on our sandwiches. Um, yes, Devon we've talked about. What else? What other sandwich meats? Like, oh, yeah, you'd get the pressed ham as well, which was in a square. In a square. Oh, yes, I do remember yep. that. Yeah, all wet. Always it wet. It was always wet. wet. Yeah, yeah. And um, mm. sometimes, I mean, we always wanted this one, but sometimes you would get the peanut butter sandwich. You can't have that now, Michelle. What? 
You can't have peanuts or seeds. You can't have hummus. You can't have peanuts in your lunchbox of any type. You can't have any nuts. In fact, you can't even have coconut. It is a health and safety issue for the school children nowadays. For fuck's sake. Allergies in it. Do you know what? I'm fucking over all this allergy bullshit. I actually think a lot of it is made up. No, I really do. Now, I'll tell you my theory on this because... Do. In the restaurant, <laughs> in the restaurant, we get a lot of people calling in. Hi, I've I've got a um, I've got a, an allergy, and like okay, a nut allergy. We always say to them, okay, how serious is this allergy? Because you know we do have nuts in our kitchen. If it's really serious, please don't eat here. We we send yeah. people away because yeah. we don't want. You can't guarantee cross contamination. No, and then you will hear people then say, oh well. I guess, I mean, it, maybe it's not really an allergy. Maybe maybe it's an intolerance. Oh. The worst is when we get vegans or people with lactose allergies and they sit down and they create some amazing like meal for them. And then at the end, we show them the desserts and we'll say, oh, this one's not for you. Oh, oh, I'm not vegan for desserts. What? Yeah. <laughs> or And then they order some fucking cream thing. Or they say, oh, yeah, um, we're lactose intolerant or we have an allergy and then they they have milk in their coffee doesn't count for ice cream that i would tell you people secrets in the restaurant if you do that you get put on a fucking blacklist you are not welcome back in a restaurant you get a gob in your coffee <laughs> no we would never <laughs> we would never do that but obviously you never your food. we yeah. it, that is one way to piss off every single person in 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 a restaurant if you have Gosh, yes. asked for a vegan meal and then you uh then you order a cream dessert or ice cream my son is currently on a very restrictive diet because he's had trouble with his tummy since he was a baby according to my husband He's had various issues. I'm not going to go into detail because, you know, fear of embarrassment and also you might turn your stomach. But he is now being put on what is common for people that they suspect to have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, I think it is. It's called a low FODMAP diet, Michelle. And don't ask me to explain what FODMAP stands for. It's F-O-D-M-A-P. And it stands for things like fructose and other things. Yeah, okay. Neil, the scientist, will know, but I can't, not only can I not recall, but I can't, I don't, can't be bothered. Mm. But it's things like he can't have anything that the dietitian explained to me. It's anything that might ferment in your stomach. So things like apples are out. Any stone fruits are out. Broccoli is out, but you can have the head of broccoli and tender stem broccoli, you know, the, the thin ones. You can have the stem. You can have the stem, oh. but not the head. Oh, so isn't that odd? You can't have asparagus. So instead, you could probably have tender stem stems. And for broccoli, you could just have the heads. Okay. It's odd. Can't have honey. Can't have agave. Can have maple syrup. Ooh. Can have sugar. Can have dairy. But at the end of the four weeks, all is not lost, poor kid. He will be able to, Oh, no onions, no garlic. <gasps> Okay. That's tough. That's really, that tough. really tough. That's tough. When we get people in the restaurant asking for things with no garlic and no onion, we generally have to send them away. Yeah. Well, you can have garlic infused oil and you can use the green parts of, I use the green part of leek and spring onions. So you can use the green bits. I guess chives, chives might even be. Chives will work. Yeah. Ch- ch- like garlic chives, whoops, maybe even garlic leaves would work as well. I wonder, like wild garlic, yeah. That's what I mean. Garlic leaves meaning gut wild garlic, yeah. Mm. But just to in to recap, what was I saying? Fodmaps. Oh yeah. After four weeks, you have to reintroduce things bit by bit. Oh, to see the reactions. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Good luck with that. And I guess you're keeping you. a diary, aren't you, of all of this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't time for a diary. No, I guess it's more about just keeping a lid on and keeping a track on what you're what you're giving and what you're what you're eliminating. Yeah. Anyway, but interesting we were talking about nut allergies cuz I when I was doing some research for this episode, research meaning googling, there was I, I wanted to look into why people like some foods and other people don't oh. like them. And I've got a lot of interesting stuff. But actually, just talking about nut allergies, it was interesting. Apparently, because there are three things that influence why you do and don't like certain foods. And one of them is past food experiences. And what I found out is that 
this actually starts even before you're born. So basically, the flavors that your mum ate when she was pregnant with you can oh. actually pass into the amniotic fluid, right? Where you're being mm. like cooked, made. Yes. So, and there was actually a study about a pregnant woman, like pregnant women and garlic. And they found that women who had garlic oil tablets 45 minutes before doing the test had amniotic fluid that smelt of garlic. Reeked of garlic. Yeah, those baby stink. So basically, I thought, I wonder if this relates to nut allergies too, because as we talked about, right. it is so common these days. And I actually don't think it was common when when we were kids, I didn't know a single person with a nut allergy. I did. Okay. I remember hearing about, oh, somebody had a Kit Kat or something, not a Kit Kat, but something that had nuts in like a Snickers or something and and then this boy died or something. Oh, I would hear about it every now and again, you know, it, in the playground as a child. I don't have any recollection of anyone in my school having any kind of allergy. And, you know, look, maybe it was my school, my year, I don't know, but... Or maybe you just didn't give a shit. Maybe. It's probably likely. But in your own bubble. <laughs> always in my own bubble. <laughs> but so I did some research on on whether or not, you know, nut allergies and, and all of this, you know, amniotic fluid and oh. things that your parent your mother eats has any bearing. And yeah, there have been some studies that show that if you eat peanuts during your pregnancy, assuming you're not already like allergic. Allergic, yeah. yeah. Then you lower the risk of your child being born with a peanut allergy. Oh, get those nuts in, pregnant ladies. Get them in. Get those nuts right in your mouth. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> get those nuts away from my face. <laughs> so it's just food for thought. I mean, I love nuts. All types of nuts. Yeah, all the nuts. I don't have children, so I don't know if my kids would have had nut allergies. But did you eat nuts? Oh. When you were pregnant, I don't remember. Mm. I see. I feel like I had a very limited diet each time I was pregnant. Although not the first time, because I had come from living in a squat in London, yeah, and I'd gone back to Australia, and I was starving. <laughs> I was starving. <laughs> I hadn't eaten for a year practically, oh my God. so I gobbled up all the food. I do remember. I was. I had been a vegetarian since I was about fourteen, Same. and. I one night smelt bacon and I thought, oh, my God, this is the middle of the night. Mm. And I thought my younger brother had come home after a few Cooking drinks. up a fry up. <laughs> I did. And I thought, if he is eating, I'm going to make him make me some. So I went downstairs and he wasn't there. No one was there. It, the whole place was clean and tidy. And I thought, right, that's it. I'm going to look in the fridge. If I see bacon, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> And I was determined, but luckily for me, I couldn't find any. Because you know what I was about to say, I wonder if you being vegetarian during your pregnancy made Killian, made Killian be a vegetarian. vegetarian. Yeah. I wonder if Maybe. there was something he didn't have that, yeah. you know, in utero food experience of meat. And maybe that's... Possibly. I wonder. But his first, first solid food was cat food. So what... What the hell? Did he get his face into penis bowl or something? <laughs> Fluffy's bowl. Fluffy's yes, he bowl. did. Oh no. <laughs> he he was learning to crawl and I looked down and the once full bowl of cat food was empty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That put him off everything for life. That's why he's vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. But then with Gretchen, which was, you know, many years later, yeah. with Gretchen, it it was, uh, she was born in the UK winter. So it was the summer pregnancy. Mm. And I lived in the, uh, I lived in uh, Hastings at the time and I would commute. So I would go past all these fields of purple sprouting broccoli and just the sight of them, Michelle, made me sick. No. I couldn't bear garlic. I couldn't bear any greens. Oh my I couldn't, gosh. my usual diet was out the window. I couldn't handle it. I subsisted on things. Is that the word? Yeah. On things like scones. I allowed myself to eat scones and cream for the first time since I was a teenager. Wow. I started eating clotted cream. I bet you still like that. I do, but I try to limit it. And what else is there? Oh, baked eggs was the thing that got me through that pregnancy. Baked so, eggs. you know, you put an egg. Yeah, you put an egg in like an earthenware, like an oven proof. Bowl oh, about that like big. like when you do Mexican eggs, 
Yeah. So you like maybe some tomato sauce or something or a bit of ham or whatever you've got. Just chuck it in, a bit of cheese on top, bake it. Amazing. Till it's just firm. Yeah. Do you know what? I remember Jen... And look, excuse me, Jen, because I keep getting things wrong. I think I have faulty memory. You'll have this one wrong. I can guarantee it. <laughs> I don't know who she was pregnant with. It, it could have been me or it could have been, you know, one of my siblings. But one of many. She just had severe and constant cravings for Dagwood dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Which okay. is... Do you want to... <laughs> Do you want to explain what a Dagwood dog is, please? It is basically the nastiest sausage full of absolute rubbish that you can ever imagine that when you go to a show, you get it on a stick and it's been coated in a batter. At the circus? You get them at the circus? I always wanted one and my mum used to say, you won't like that. And I was like, I'll be the fucking judge of that bitch. (laughs) Three years old. (laughs) Give me that Dagwood dog. Give it to me. And it's always red. Yeah, it's red and it, oh, just disgusting. Mum, ah. mum didn't want anything else but Dagwood dogs. <laughs> so I don't know which pregnancy oh, that who was. Who was that? I don't know. <laughs> Get in touch, Jen. <laughs> which of the four were made of Dagwood dogs, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's you. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm vegetarian. <laughs> I just had too many oh, Dagwood God. dogs in utero. No, but I, same as you, I, I was... I've been vegetarian since I was about probably about 14 or 15. I can't remember exactly when. I do think Morrissey had a part to play in this. Meat is murder. Okay. Of course. Meat is murder. Murder. Yeah. 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 But I've I've remained vegetarian since then. Yes. You haven't fallen off the wagon unlike me. No. Although saying that, and this drives Andreas crazy because he will cook something and I'll say, oh, I used to love bacon. Or I used to love those sausages. Or I used to love eating... Why would you say that? Because I think initially I said it just because it was a throwaway comment. Now it just yeah. winds him up. <laughs> well, because he'll probably be thinking, why are you denying yourself? Yes, he, he thinks that all the time. And in fact, yeah. when we first got together, I was vegan and had been vegan for many years before it was trendy. Um, now I'm not vegan. Now I'm just vegetarian. Because when we first got together, it was more Andreas. When we first got together, he I had said to him, now listen, I'm vegan. Is that an issue? No, of course not. No, no. Uh-huh. And actually I was... He just wanted the poontang. He can say anything to get, to get some <laughs> pussy. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so he's like, no, being vegan's not a problem. Very quickly, it became a big problem. And yes. to the point where, you know, they say, they say, when you're in a relationship, don't change for anyone. You shouldn't have to change yeah. to be with someone. Well, he was de- basically demanding, if you, you either go back to be vegetarian or this relationship's over, he couldn't handle it. Did he say that in such strong terms? He basically said, I, I can't be with someone who's vegan. It's it's too much. It's too limiting. It's too restricting. It's upsetting. It it upset right. him. It's upsetting. It was like, more for me. He felt like, well, first of all, it really limited where we could go out and eat. And one of his greatest pleasures, obviously being a restaurateur, is, mm. is food. He loves it. And he yeah. just felt that we couldn't enjoy going out to restaurants together. And because it's such a big part of his life, it was really upsetting for him that he would be ordering some incredible dish and I would be there having pasta. A bowl of dust. But pasta with, with tomato. Basically, it's every meal I would have in this town whenever we would go anywhere in Switzerland. So it was upsetting for him. When you eat out, yeah. Mm. But I mean, you're not boring when it comes to food choices. No. You love flavours and tastes and textures. You're quite experimental. I, I know that you used to have natto for breakfast. Oh, I love that. If I could get it here in Switzerland, I'd still be having it every morning, full of K2. But it was um, it was very upsetting for him. So... He said, please just eat meat. And I'm like, no, how about no. how about I just go back to being vegetarian? So that really opened up a whole new world, basically. And But of course, no one stops at one compromise. Now he's always like, whenever we have a meal. Is he trying to shove a steak in yeah, your Yeah, he's eating a steak and he's like, want to try? I'm like, babe, that gets that's old. Stop saying that. It's, it's old now. <laughs> but it, he will always try and get me to have a little little taste of some fish or a bit of this or that but no 
I'm not I'm not interested. Has that been an issue in the past? What do you mean with any anyone else? In other relationships, yeah. No, my past boyfriend became vegetarian and I believe still is. The other boyfriend, he I mean he didn't care about food. Absolutely saw food okay. as fuel. Well, that would be more of a problem for me. It was an issue because I would cook amazing food, yeah. he wasn't interested. He would live on some shit packet cake and two bottles of diet, litre bottles of diet coke a day. Yeah. So that was, I can, and that actually gave me, I think, an insight into how Andreas must have felt to be with someone who was not on his wavelength with food. When it comes to one of his passions. Yeah. And, you know, it actually coincided with me not feeling great having been vegan for so long. Because not having eggs in my diet really affected my body. Um, B12 was low. And we've maybe talked about B12 on the podcast before. I can't remember. I can't remember anything, Jordy. But B12 is a real problem for a lot of vegans because it it makes you tired. You don't function properly. Your brain just basically melts. And the issue is when you go to the doctor – they will do a B12 test, but they cannot distinguish between active and inactive B12. So your B12 test may come back as, oh, you've got loads of B12. Don't worry. You're absolutely fine, which is what was happening to me. I was going and getting B12 tests. However, I was full of inactive B12. So I had loads of it, but I may, I, my body was actually starving of B12. So I had to start injecting B12 and... Oh, my God. Did you not know that? No. I thought that you were taking it, but I didn't know you were in- injecting it. Yeah, for about a year and a half, I was injecting B12. It's not fun. I don't know how diabetics mm. inject themselves. but right. So I was doing that yeah. for about a year and a half, and now I just am eating eggs. I have to have an egg a day, have to minimum, have one egg yeah. a day just to keep me on the straight and narrow. And that's because of a vegan diet. So people, please be careful about when you're going vegan because they don't tell you all the things that can go wrong when you're deplete, mm. depleting your body of certain nutrients. But yeah, so when Andrea said, like, start eating decent food or we're done, um, I was like, yeah, all right. I'll I'll put eggs and cheese back in into the mix. And actually, you know, I mean, living in Switzerland uh, when I'm here, yeah, it's hard to not have cheese. It's a, it's the country full of cheese. I mean, fondue and raclette are their national dish. Basically, melted cheese. Yeah. Like, come on. So there, there you have it. Extra, extra, read all about Give it. Give me the scoop. He's dropping wind and there's no doubt about it. He's dropping. So, you know, my husband likes food mm. and particularly he likes to forage. Okay. And he will forage every month of the year for different things. And he's always done it because he's a, he's a woodsman. Yeah. Because when, I, when we were thinking about this episode and I was thinking about all the things I, I liked as an Australian girl growing up, I liked things like chocolate paddle pops. They're the things that I would have when I went back to Australia. Chocolate paddle pops cheese twisties and potato scallops from the takeaway for 10 cents each. Do you know why though? Because you grew up with Granny's goodies. Yes, that's right. My mother owned the local takeaway in Milk Bar. Granny's goodies. And we did the Granny Burger. We've talked about that before, but we didn't do potato scallops. I would have liked to have done them. We did spring rolls. No, I had to go elsewhere to get my scallops. They're the lifeblood of any Milk Bar. Especially on the coast. Yeah. But going back to my husband, he forages. So I I also thought that one of the other things that I enjoyed eating growing up was when I'd go to a particular beach, and I won't say the name of it because everyone will be there trying to do it. And I did notice people there last time when we were there, Michelle, doing this. But there's a way of foraging pippies, which are like a large clam. And you do the twist in the sand and they all come up. You catch them, you put them in your bowl of fresh water or fresh water. I don't know what you do, but you have to cleanse them. Otherwise, you get sand in your mouth yep. and they're delicious. Just boil them quickly, stir them up with a bit of garlic and cider vinegar or something. And it's lovely. Do you know what? That's basically a pasta of wongole. 
Exactly. It's exactly that. Yeah, you can do a vongole with the with the pippies rather than tiny clams. Pasta vongole. But anyway, my husband would forage all sorts of things from nettle. So we'll have nettle soup usually in the spring. Elderflower a bit later on, he'll start making elderflower cordial. Elderberries, so that he saves them, dries them and then makes cough syrups with them. Slow berries, bullis berries, they're all kind of the same but different sizes, which he makes, he turns into a Christmas gin. And blackberries, of course, which are out now, but mushrooms are the big one and they're the ones that seem to upset people the most because everybody goes oh no they won't touch them his father would never touch his mushrooms i've eaten paddy's pickled mushrooms they're fantastic i've also yeah. been the very grateful recipient of his slow gin my god oh, yes. absolutely wonderful 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 my mum loves it too yum love it we do it every year mish well i talking about elderflower Get your pens and paper out, people, because this is an amazing Swiss cocktail that we do in the restaurant. It's very popular here. So they call it a Hugo. Do you know this? No. So it's one DL, one deciliter of Prosecco. And then you get to... What's a deciliter? How many mils is that? uh, I guess 10, 10, 10 mils. That's not very much Prosecco. No, it must be 100 then. Okay. I don't know. Put your pens and papers down. Yes, I- <laughs> okay, people, put them down. Don't bother writing this. They do all everything in DL here. And I've never actually thought, okay. what's a DL? I, I, do you know what? It's probably 100 mils. It must be 100 okay. mils. It must it be. It must be. Right. So, so you get your Prosecco. And then there is actually a an elderflower liqueur called St. Germain. Have you heard of it? Yes, St. Germain. Yep. St. Germain. Sorry. I'm not. I'm not uh, for Parisian. It's but it's not. It's not elderberry. No, it's, it's elderflower. Flower. It's elderflower yeah. liqueur. Yeah. Or equally, if you don't want the extra booze, you can just use the elderflower cordial. You can buy it in your supermarket. Yes. Or make it yourself yeah. if you're patty. And then you add a squeeze of lime, and a little bit of sparkling water, so it's more like a. Sp- and then you just have the lime and a fresh sprig of mint which you smack like you clap it so you get all the smell coming you bruise it put it in done it is the most popular summer summer spritz here in switzerland oh a spritz i love that. yeah it's lovely so there you go hugo spritz so shall i tell you more about mushrooms michelle yes because i also am very keen about your mushroom coffee situation oh right yes okay well before we go into that i'll just quickly tell you that most people who hear that that paddy forages mushrooms immediately think of psycho tropic oh yeah like like magic magic mushrooms magic mushrooms yes which i'm sure he has foraged for on you know in the past but mostly actually mostly it's because he is a he likes the mushrooms that his his german mother east german mother taught him how to forage (gasps) from a child so he goes for the ones which are called seps, or he calls them Steinpilz in German, otherwise known as Belitis. So they are the big, fat, spongy ones that you get under trees. Not in fields, not in fields, people. They're field mushrooms or they're deadly, so don't go there. No, we have, we have them all. We forage here, too, for the restaurant, and we mm. have those on the menu. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Steinpilz, they're the best. They're amazing. Chanterelles, all sorts. Yep. But... What you don't want to do, you do need to know. And Paddy, if he's if he discovers a new one that he's absolutely not sure about, he will take a sample. He'll let like leave it on a piece of paper so it leaves a shadow, and he cross references and cross checks yeah. it, all sorts. He he's absolutely analytical. So I have always trusted that I will not die on Paddy's watch when it comes to mushrooms. So good on you. That's good because other people do have and do continue to from eating mushrooms. There's the death cap. There's the destroying angels. There's the cortinarius. And they all cause gruesome deaths, organ failure. Bloody hell. Often you get to death's door and you and you think you're going to be a goner and then suddenly you perk up. Oh. Then you die. Oh, oh no. <laughs> and a lot of Asian families fall prey to this because they relocate to Europe and they think they know the shrooms that they're going to be picking because the, you know, they look the same as the ones in their country and they're not no. and by the time they realise it is too late whole families have been wiped out due to this Jesus that's terrible and what happens I know what happens is after eating one you wouldn't normally show symptoms for the first 24 hours yeah. you wouldn't even know something was wrong because they usually have a pleasant taste yep. 
So it's a false sense of security for 24 hours. That's terrible. Yep. You think, oh, that's fine. I don't feel unwell at all. 24 hours later, you get stomach upsets, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, cold sweats. Oh, my God. The poison destroys the internal organs. So without (gasps) treatment... The victim will grow so weak that they die of heart failure or massive organ failure. Bloody hell. I love when you say massive organ in a sentence. A massive organ failure. (laughs) (laughs) In serious cases of poisoning, you can have a blood transfusion, dialysis or liver and kidney transplants. They're all necessary to save you. But even these measures are not successful and death usually occurs between six and 16 days after consumption. That is a long, lingering, mm. painful, horrible death. Isn't it? Horrific. Fuck. Those mushrooms are responsible for 90% of all fatal mushroom poisonings mm. and are thought to have caused the deaths of Roman Emperor Claudius in 45 AD and Holy Roman Emperor Charles the Sixth in 1740. Well, there you go. Facts. Step me up. Step time. Step time. Step time. Stats and facts. Now, there's one other thing I need to warn you about. This is from Paddy as well. The oleander bush or tree or whatever it is. Okay. I didn't get time to do enough Googling on that one. But he has told me in the past that families have died from oleander bush poisoning because they might be out in the woods and they make a barbecue and they use the branches (gasps) and they barbecue their meat on it and whole families have died that way as well. Okay. (gasps) Warning. Well... Warning, warning. Not a trigger warning, but a warning, yes. please. Safety warning. Yeah. Health warning. Be careful what branches you put on your, on your barbie, peeps. Do not forage or eat anything wild unless you absolutely know what it yeah, is. Yeah, you have to know what you're doing. You're not a toddler. No, because we, we use a lot of foraged foods in the restaurant, actually. We use um, sour clay, which is uh, it's like a clover that grows... In the in the woods, and it's amazing. It tastes like a that like ci- sorrel. Yeah, kind of. I guess it's like a citrus clover, and oh, that sounds like sorrel. Yeah, it looks like clover, yeah. and it's really juicy and lemony. Yes, yeah. and we make ice cream. That's wood sorrel. Yeah, maybe wood sorrel. We make ice yeah. cream out of it, and salad dressings and all sorts, and blueberries Ooh. up on the mountains. Incredible Ooh, amount lovely. of wild blueberries, and we we make. Everything again, salad dressings, sorbets. We just throw them on all the dishes. Make lovely blueberry ketchups and all sorts in in the oh. restaurant. Yeah, lovely. So and then there's watercress growing everywhere and and wood. They call it it's it's a mushroom, but they call it wood steak or something. Anyway, oh, chicken of the woods. That's it. Yeah. Amazing mushroom. How do you get that? Yeah, yeah. It's a fungus that grows on a tree. You've got to be very good at cooking to make that taste nice. <laughs> It's pretty bland. Oh, well, you can, you know, it's like a sponge. You can add all sorts and make yes, it tasty. Exactly. True Gen True. True Gen True. Andreas gets upset with me because I think I'm a, a little bit obsessed by supplements. I love them. I love a supplement. I will take me too. millions of them. And he gets upset with me. He says, just eat food. Eat food. Just eat food. Yeah. And I say, well, I want to do this instead. Just shut up. Let me do what I want. There are new tropics you can buy as supplements because I was looking more for ones for memory and brain fog. What did I do? Just pop. What? What? No. <laughs> said you heard me pop and I'm like I did not fart on no. hair <laughs> what no I said nootropics that you can just pop like a pill pop. is what I meant oh, okay. not you didn't just pop I don't... you're so you've got such bad brain fog that you don't even know if you farted I don't these days it just slides <laughs> right out anyway um oh Michelle oh, I mean... no but brain fog brain fog is the reason why I'm taking the nootropics has it helped I think so. Okay. I am pretty foggy still, but imagine what I'd be like without them. Well, this is the thing. I think I need to start because, and I've done research. So acetylcholine, acetylcholine, Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, it's important for lots of bodily functions. Um, It helps keep your muscles metabolically active in Improves tissue health, muscle growth, skin tone, bone density, and fat loss. But also, it 
really helps with memory and memory disorder. So out, people with Alzheimer's will often take choline and all this sort of stuff. And also it's sluggish bowel function, which I've had ever since I was born anyway. Nice. That'll be all the Dagwood dogs, Michelle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> so acetyl l carnitine Carni- oh my anyway, God. that apparently is very good for uh, slowing the aging of the brain and uh, helping in like memory. And then PC, but GPC choline apparently is very, very good. And have you heard of nootropic stacks? No. So it's a way of just taking specific, st- you stack the, the nootropic pills um, to get the most benefits and there are there's this thing called a Mr. Happy stack you can get a memory stack and all this kind of stuff you have to go oh, online oh. and look from mainly on reddit so god knows how like accurate they are but yeah there are all of these stacks you can take and I'm actually thinking of going hardcore and trying these memory stacks and they also say they cut through the brain fog because I feel like I, I I need it I need it I can imagine you'll end up being like Scarlett Johansson in that film where she's superhuman, Lucy. <laughs> it's a great film. Watch that. It's so good. Like she takes all that. She's like helping. She's drug running and she takes all this drug. Okay. And it ends up giving her superhuman qualities. I would love that. That's going to be you. I would like superhuman brain qualities right now. So I'm yep. going to start my nootropic journey and I'm going to keep you all informed just to see. And I'm going to maybe like, I guess, monitor the benefits or the non, non-benefits non and... Watch this space. They've been, they're very trendy. Nootropics, good for, for people and their brain function, people... Well, kids are using them to study better. Ah. I'm gonna, I'm going to spend the money, and I'll report back. Okay. Maybe just to wrap up this food episode. Food frenzy, I, yes. The food frenzy. I ha- I was thinking about food from our childhood because my sister had said she loves all of that nostalgia. There were some ice lollies from back in the day that you were reeling off to me recently. Things like Bubble O Bill, Funny Feet, Cool Shark. I don't, oh, hang on. Yeah, I do you remember that one? <laughs> it was the blue icy pole with yes, the, in its shape of a, a shark. shark. Scribbler. Scribbler, yes. Yeah, it was like a, a pencil, pencil. And the ballpoint nib was a bubble gum, I think. That's right. Classic golden gay time. Yes, everyone loves a golden gay time. In more innocent days, more innocent days when they are very an ice special. cream could be called a gay time. I mean, you can't go wrong. There's a chocolate centre. Like this is basically yeah. a just chocolate on a stick covered in ice cream that has chunks of toffee in it, covered in more chocolate that has chunks of toffee in it. Is that right? Covered in the toffee with the with the crunchy, crunchy bits on the outside. Toffee bits, yeah. I tell you what, we always had. This was more a home ice cream. It wasn't even ice cream. It was an icy pop. The yeah. Super Dupers. What are they? The long skinny ones with different. They colors. were the long skinny ones. And you you they also were called. Yeah, you freeze them at home. We always wanted the Zupa Dupas because you would get like the cartoon figures on the front. Or sometimes they did like a Star Wars, you know, like collab. We always just had the home brand ones. But we still loved them. The blue ones were always a favourite. The blue ones always went first. And the red. The blue and the red ones are very important. Yeah, Mm. I love those two. No one wants the green or the yellow. But I have a story about that just quickly. When uh, my my nana used to keep those in her deep freeze and one day she wasn't around and I went hunting for one. And then I saw a big tray of ice cubes. And for some reason, I thought, oh, I'll put my tongue on that. And it it stuck. No. (laughs) And because no one was there to help me, I panicked (gasps) and I ripped it off. No. Along with the top layer of my tongue. Horrific. Oh, my God. That's horrible. <laughs> and there was just like, yeah, there was a, like an ice cube tray with the top of my tongue stuck to it. Ugh. Sorry. <laughs> Fucking hell. I don't know if you had this, but the Woman's Weekly cookbook of birthday cakes. Oh, yeah. The farm. My mum made the farm year after year with all the chocolate biscuits, like the chocolate finger biscuits all the way round. I wanted not the farm. I wanted the swimming pool. So you would have the chocolate finger biscuits all around the outside, two musk sticks for the ladder to get Uh. into the pool, which was a cake scooped out and then with blue jelly put in the middle. (laughs) 
And then you would have the little like people swimming. As kids, we spent hours looking at that book. Like, I want this. I want that. Mom, I want this for my birthday. It would change a million times. But I remember once I made the butterfly cake. Do you remember that? No. The butterfly. There was a butterfly cake. We went to school at at Hall Primary, which is a, a farm school, basically. And through that, we became part of the rural youth. Sounds like a new political movement. <laughs> they had these fairs and they had this fair where you could like bake a cake and it would be kind of a little bit like, you know, WI, I guess. And so I made a cake and I made the butterfly cake and I was so proud because it looked absolutely fucking fantastic. It had like licorice all around the outside and all the colours. It looked incredible. Did you win the prize? Well, I put it down to have to be judged and they were, you know, like processing it. Dog came up and ate my cake. Oh, oh <laughs> shit. A sheep dog came up, made a beeline straight for my butterfly cake, ate my oh, cake. Oh, God. Did you cry? Well, they gave me third place as a as a highly commended or something. And I did. I cried. Mom, the dog ate my cake. What awful luck. That's terrible. Very upsetting. But anyway, yes. Well, Michelle... Thank you for that chitter-chatter about food and other (laughs) segues. Oh, thank you. Quite a few awkward segues in that episode. (laughs) We have run out of time, so we're going to have to move on. I'm actually hungry, so I'm going to go and have my egg for the day. I'm going to scramble it with chilli, I think, today. Yum. Andreas brings back from Sweden this thing for me. It's um, called Vegia. It's vegan caviar in a tube. Oh, wow. It's smoked. It's made from seaweed. It's smoked with dill and all sorts of things. Oh, my God. On eggs, it's absolute heaven. I'm going to have that right now. Cool. (laughs) So, enjoy that. Get off the bloody blower. Get off the blower, will you? Go and make yourself an egg and (laughs) veggie. Get that down, you Gregory Peck. Yeah, my neck hole. Well, thanks for the chit-chat. Thank you, Michelle. And everybody out there, thank you for listening and putting up with this constant chitter chatter. <laughs> and just make sure that you keep eavesdropping. 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 Eavesdropping.